So in this uh, first session yeah, of numerical methods, I like to well, give a small motivation. It's a short uh, motivation on what I like to do in this lecture. So first, the aim of the lecture, well, it's called numerical methods. So of course, I like to teach you numerical methods. And that is, I will also teach you a little bit about the theory. So for example, convergence results. Um, then it's called numerical methods in mathematical finance. So, well, the numerical methods I'm presenting here are universal. So you can use them in many other applications, uh, but mathematical finance is one of our applications. So we have an application. Yeah, so that is here, mathematical finance. And then a strong focus of this lecture is also the implementation. So we will do object-oriented implementation. So object-oriented implementation, we will be using Java here, well, but that's not so important. Yeah, you could use uh, C-sharp, Scala or whatever. Um, and I believe it's very important to see the link between these three things. So I'm a mathematician, but I'm also a programmer and I try to be a good programmer. So I know the mathematical model and from the mathematical side, from the theory. And I know how to implement the model in a computer. And that's actually an advantage. Yeah? So for example, a mathematician knows that for a symmetric matrix, you only need to do half the work. So you can make your algorithm more efficient. So knowing the theory is an advantage in the sense that it allows for more efficient implementation. So this enables you to create more efficient implementations. Or it also enables you to create better designs. So the science in the sense object-oriented implementation, if you know what the mathematical object is, you maybe have a feeling uh, which object should belong to which class yeah, in the object-oriented design. Okay, so the application is also important the application provides us with an intuition. So if you, for example, know that something is an interest rate, yes, you know that it is a rate, it is something per time. So you have a certain intuition for the mathematical object. So we also have a benefit from knowing the application. So the application provides us with an intuition. With this intuition, maybe we have an idea of some some relation that should hold in theory, and then we can uh, we can work on this. Okay, so um, but do you need to be a good uh, programmer, yeah, to understand the mathematics? Well, there's also a nice benefit from uh, doing the implementation for knowing the imp how to do the implementation. For example, the implementation gives you a laboratory to simulate the model you know, and to understand the theory. So to provide experiments, to create experiments with the theory. 
so we can test yeah so uh, how does the convergence uh, actually look yeah if we implement it into the computer and this actually then provides here new insights for the application and also for the theory so this is our laboratory and I already motivated that it's uh, good to understand the theory to have an uh, efficient program, but the program also gives you something back yeah, because you, we will then explore uh, the model and we will, we will really do this in this uh, uh, lecture hands on. And of course, there is another aim of this lecture. Uh, so say last but not least, yeah, let's have some fun with say all this, for example, also with coding, coding this stuff in the computer. Okay, so that's the aim of this lecture. I would like to uh, cover here a little bit all three aspects of numerical methods. So we will see a little bit of the theory, like convergence results, the algorithms, and I will have a look at uh, state-of-the-art implementation. So our application is uh, mathematical finance. Well, but that's just one possible application. Yeah, I thought that's helpful to, to let's say, try some experiments with these methods. Um, and this will in the end also improve our understanding of the mathematical model uh, if we do some computer simulation. And I would like to use some state-of-the-art software development tools. Um, so some programming design patterns uh, well, maybe we don't try, uh, dive too deep into programming design patterns, but we will work a lot with interfaces, which is already uh, enabling um, a very clean coding, uh, a little bit of dependency injection, factory methods, and so on. And um, I also like to use some state-of-the-art tools like uh, development environments like Eclipse, a revision control system like Git, uh, build management tools like Maven, uh, unit testing using JUnit, and maybe you can also have a look at integration servers, continuous integration servers. And I believe all this is really fun. Yeah? So there are a few nice surprising uh, results we can explore. The, we can explore here. Uh, let me finish this motivation using a very classical motivation here from mathematical finance. So you maybe know the classical Black-Scholes model for a stock. So there's the Black-Scholes model for a stock here. So this is here um, a stochastic differential equation. So an SDE that is describing the dynamic of the stock S as a function of time. And there is um, a second asset. So here N is the value of a one unit of currency or N zero units of currency in a bank account. So that is the evolution of a value that has been put in a bank account. So we have two assets on our market. Well, if you look here um, at this uh, bank account, so if I look here at N, uh, you see that the change of N over an infinitesimal time step. So the infinitesimal change of N over dt is proportional to the current uh, value 
of n. So this is r times n. And you know the solution of this, so this is now an ODE, the solution of this is that n of t has exponential growth with rate r. Yeah? So the initial value here is n of t zero times e to the r t minus t zero. So that guy n would look um, would look like this. So let's let's have a small graph here. So I have time, and maybe here is the initial value uh, of n at time uh, t zero. So that's here t zero. So then I have some exponential growth. So maybe something like this here. Yeah? Okay. So that's n of t. So my stock S, so let's draw now the stock S here, has also the same exponential growth. So there is here this part R times S dt, but there's also an additional part sigma S dw, and the um, dw here is Brownian increment, so it is an infinitesimal increment, which is well normal distributed. Okay, so ma to make this precise, what does this mean? So it means that delta w, say from uh, for a certain uh, time step, um, so delta w of t, let's define this as the integral from little t to t plus delta t dw of tau. So this guy is normal distributed. So this guy is normal distributed. So if you add all these small increments yeah, or even a larger increments, the sum of independent normal increments is still normal. Yeah? You have some normal distribution and uh, it has mean zero and uh, variance. Yeah, so it has standard deviation. So let's write standard deviation square root of delta t. Okay, so I assume you all know this. So my little stock here has maybe initial value here. No? So initial value could be different. And the stock also has some exponential growth, but there is this random part here there is this random part. And this random part then means that actually the value is wiggling around randomly here. Okay, and they are different paths. Okay, so you know this, this uh, uh, model here. Okay, so I have now a model for the movement of the stock. Okay, and then you can look at a fixed time, for example, here, this is capital T, you can look at the distribution that you observe for the stock value. So my bank account has some fixed value. So it has reached this point here, but the stock is a random variable. So S of this capital T is a random variable. And the classic question is, if you have a payment that depends on this future value of the stock, what is its value? And maybe you know the universal pricing theorem that such a function of the stock, of a future value of the stock, well, can be valued by taking the expectation under the so-called risk neutral measure. So that means I have to take the expectation of a function of a random variable. Okay, so that's a classical result and you also have to multiply with n of t zero. Yeah? So just take this result as a black box. And the big question is, what is this expectation? So I like to know this expectation here. So I like to solve this problem with numerical methods. Well, for 
certain functions f, you can solve this problem analytically. You can derive an analytic formula, but um, let's take this as a motivation for solving this numerically with a computer. So already here on the slides, there are different steps that all require different numerical methods. And in this uh, lecture, I like to cover uh, some of those uh, methods. Well, we will cover all methods that are required to calculate this um, expectation. So one question is, how do you create actually this random variable? If you have the specification of a stochastic process, so I need some kind of time discretization. And another question is, if I have a random variable, how do I approximate an expectation? Okay, so this here is the um, application. So the universal pricing theorem, if you, for example, consider the function maximum of s minus k and zero, then this here, this payoff is the payoff of an option. And I have that this value of the option is given by this expression here, which is an expectation of a function of a random variable where the random variable is described by a stochastic differential equation. So to solve this numerically, there are several steps we have to do. So we need to calculate or we need to approximate the expectation of a random variable x. Yeah? So x is now this function of s of t divided by n of t. And then what is the S, okay, we need to construct or to approximate the S of T from the model where the model is in stochastic differential equation or an ODE yeah, for N. Given that we have certain parameters so these are our inputs. So how is that done? So this is, for example, done by doing a time discretization. So this means you replace the differential with some finite difference. So if I go back here, whenever I observe here a differential, I replace that with the finite difference, then I re uh, arrive at this expression here. The change of s is r times s, the change of time for a finite difference, plus sigma s delta w. Uh, so delta w is now a normal distributed random variable. And that gives me some method to create s at a later time given that I know S at an earlier time. So this is already here a discretization scheme. Yeah? So this is already a numerical method, which we will learn later. So actually, if you replace the infinitesimal D, yeah, the differential with this delta, yeah, this is an approximation. Actually, it's wrong here to just write S. It's not the same S. It is an approximation of S, okay? Um, so the question is, uh, what is the approximation error and how does this converge if we make the time step smaller? So here on the slide, you already see two very important uh, numerical methods. So the first one answering the question, how can we calculate in expectation is the Monte Carlo method. And the second one, the question, how can we approximate a stochastic differential equation, so a continuum of random variables with say a time discrete set of random variables. So this is the time discretization of SDEs. So time discretization. 
So for example, like the Euler scheme. So what you see here on the slide is the Euler scheme. Okay, so that's um, a small motivation. So my first sessions will cover computer arithmetic, which is a completely different topic. But then the next session will look at Monte Carlo method and time discretization of stochastic differential equations.